Okay. So welcome everyone, and people are still coming in for the class on, we've finished the section dealing with history. The focus tonight is really on holiness, holiness in space, and particularly holiness at the temple, the ancient temple in Jerusalem, uh, the synagogue space, and your home as holy space. Um, so I presume everyone can see the slides. If not, chime in. Okay, so the first thing that God says in the Bible as being holy is time. It says on, in the first book of Genesis, uh, I guess the second, I'm sorry, the, the first, the second chapter of Genesis, God, it says, God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. God gives Abraham the land, but doesn't describe it as the holy land. I mean, we, we call it today the holy land. In rabbinic tradition, the concept of God making space holy or sort of spiritually elevated only occurs after the sin of the golden calf with the idea that God sort of condescends and understands that people want to worship something physical. So therefore, God is going to give us a, a tabernacle, uh, which is the precursor uh, to the temple. Um, Jerusalem and the temples. So, you know, in, in the story of the history, you went through the history very quickly uh, a few weeks ago. Um, you have King Saul, and the second king of Israel is David. And David conquers the city, but according to, to the Bible, I think this is more in Chronicles than in Kings, than in Samuel and Kings. Um, David is told he can't build the holy temple um, because he has been a man of war. And so only his son Solomon, who uh, his name in Hebrew is Shlomo, which means his peace, or he is peace. Um, uh, only Solomon will be able to build the temple. So we're going to see some, some pictures of, of, of the area. So David brings the ark eventually to Jerusalem, puts it on what will become the Temple Mount, not only the ark, but the, the, the portable traveling um, temple, the, the Mishkan, the tabernacle and put it on the, on the Temple Mount, but eventually it's gonna be Solomon who will build the actual temple. And one of the interesting things I find, you know, very counterintuitive, we think of, of Ark as being so holy and sacred and you wanna protect it. Uh, it was almost like a talisman, a, a object that had magical powers when viewed uh, uh, in this context. So David, when he fought battles, would actually bring the Ark with him into battle with the idea almost like a flag that this battle is going to protect going to protect us and make sure that god who you know, the gods at this time were understood to be the military gods god that would fight for people that god is on our side and there's one period of time i, I think it's the philistines that capture the ark and they get a illness which is is one of these words in the bible that is only used once and so you will often see it translated as hemorrhoids. But in fact, some scholar, a scholar I read um, thought that, that what, what they, the Egyptians were struck with was erectile dysfunction. And when, because the solution was to make golden hemorrhoids. And so they think these were actually phalluses. So that's a, sort of an interesting, somewhat salacious sidelight. Um, but so Solomon will build the first temple around 900 BCE. That temple will be destroyed in 586 BCE by the Babylonians in the areas what is currently Iraq. Uh, Cyrus quickly conquers Babylon and Cyrus allows the Jews to return and rebuild the temple. And they do so about 80 years later, but it's a pale imitation of the original. And there's discussion in the Talmud. They said the people who had seen both uh, although 80 years is a lot, I'm not sure how precise that number is. People who had seen the Solomon's temple and seen the rebuilt temple would would weep because the rebuilt temple was such a pale uh, imitation of the original. Uh, then much later on, about 30 BCE, so we're talking now over 500 years later, under the influence of Rome, uh, with Herod as the being put on the throne of Israel, Herod was a great builder. 
And so he does a magnificent job of rebuilding the temple. It's, it's not considered to be the third temple, it's still considered to be the second temple. And the, um, um, that temple stands for about a hundred years on what is the Temple Mount uh, today. And it's destroyed by the Romans in the year 70. So I know it may not be all that easy to see uh, this chart. So this is Solomon's Jerusalem. Here is the Temple Mount. Uh, the temple is there. And most scholars believe the spot of the temple is uh, where it stood, both first, second, first Temple and Second Temple, was about where the Dome of the Rock now stands. And they think the rock was sacred to both the Jews, uh, understood to be the top of Mount Moriah, I'll say a little more about that later, and eventually to the Muslims. So, and this says uh, the royal complex and, the, and uh, I guess a palace. Well, I think the palace was down here. There's a lot of excavation going on in what is called the City of David here. And there's just amazing stuff. I was, I was there a couple of years ago and the excavations going on now and the rebuilding and the investigation is, is, is fantastic. Um, there is a spring, I don't know if it's identified here. Basically, David built, the, the reason to have the city exist here was there was a natural water source and David built, uh, uh, protected the water source with walls. And even there was a, a tunnel called Hezekiah's tunnel, which carried the water from, from its location in, uh, in toward the palace. There's not a lot of archeological evidence here. I just uh, watched a video about some archeology span from this time. And the comment was made, all of the authenticated artifacts from this time could fit in a shoebox. So there's a lot that still needs to be done. There is a lot of archeology span going on here. So this was the, 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 the Jerusalem in the time of David. And here is an artist concept of Solomon's temple. It would be facing east. The, the Western wall would be on this side. The major city of Jerusalem is on, is on this side. Um, then, as I mentioned, Herod, who was a fantastic builder, greatly enlarges what is called the Temple Mount. And some scholars believe he had to do this because in the intervening period, they think there were burials. There was uh, people buried in this area and you can't have a priest inside a cemetery. So underneath the Temple Mount are vaults, are open areas. In fact, Muslims have built prayer chambers underneath there. And there are sketches from the time when the British archeologists explored under the Temple Mount. Um, so, so when we, what, what is the Western Wall today is right over here. So the Western Wall is not a wall of the temple. There's the second temple rebuilt by Herod. The Western Wall is actually part of the retaining wall. And all the wall here is underground. This has all been excavated here. And you'll see some pictures, I think, of, um, of the southern wall, and you can actually see the eastern wall also. So a lot of these retaining walls have been uh, uncovered. Um, th there is a wonderful model, it's called the Holy Land model, whole, uh, because it was originally built and placed in a, in a hotel, the Holy Land Hotel. And uh, you can't really see people here, but um, it is a, it's a pretty large scale model. So here's Herod's temple looking from the east. There's the opening of the temple. And here's the, um, also the Holy Land model with some gates. I'm gonna show you those gates. Um, Robinson's arch we're gonna talk about. So in second temple times, there was a, a city here, the, the city of Jerusalem under, uh, you know, un, under the later kings of Israel. And certainly in Roman times, when the Romans built the theater, they think maybe the Romans built a stadium here. And so there was a city here, and then there's a big valley here. And so to get to the temple, you had to walk from here. And you, if you didn't want to go down into the valley, and there would be you know, probably uh, water and even sewage flowing in the valley. So there, was, there were archways built and a bridge built to get into the temple. And it's, it's very interesting because you're going to see how those things look uh, today. 
And then there were two sets of gates and people would walk up these stairs and some of the original stairs still stand. People would walk up these stairs and go into the temple. And then depending on your status, if you were a priest, you could get into the sort of the inner sanctums. If you were a Levite, you could get into certain areas. If you were male, you could get into certain areas. If you were Jewish, you could get into certain areas. And there were certain areas where anyone could go but people would typically walk in one direction and come out the other way, unless you were in mourning. If you were in mourning, you would enter through the other gate. And so people would know you were in mourning and could respond accordingly. So I mentioned Robinson's arch. This is the artist's concept of what it looked like. So you had a street level far below, those are people there. And then in 1967, recalling the history of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem, you know, was a city occupied by lots of different folks. And then with the um, United Nations partition, Jerusalem was supposed to be an open city, uh, open to, to all the religious faiths. And there were synagogues and there were mosques and churches and so on. And the, uh, the Jordanians captured the old city and actually destroyed all of the synagogues and all the Jewish relics in the old city. Um, but not a lot of excavation had been done at that time. So here's Robinson's Arch in 1967. In 1967, with the Six Day War, the Israelis uh, conquered the old city. And, and so you could stand up, this I think was an onion field, you could stand up and lean against this, this arch. Today, it is very far up. So this, this gives you an idea of the levels of excavation that have been done um, you know, since 1967. The, uh, the Israelis granted sovereignty to the of the Temple Mount to the Muslims. And so there's no excavation being done under the Temple Mount. They would love to be, do digging under the Temple Mount, uh, but that's not permitted. But around the Temple Mount in areas that Isra Israel controls, there's, there's lots of, of excavation. So again, uh, so this is Wilson's Arch. Wilson's Arch is that bridge going from the city into the temple. And you can see an arch there. So today, I mean, they haven't dug under here. They built a big plaza where people pray. This is on the men's side. So you can see you could almost reach up, I suppose if you were a lot taller than these folks, you could maybe jump up and touch the top of the arch. But again, you can see how much lower the street level is here. And then this is actually inside this area. There's a, a men's prey area. Uh, uh, Murray. Uh, you mentioned this about the excavation. And mm -hmm. um, I've known, for example, uh, I, I guess you mentioned one time that uh, once the land is, is uh, uh, under Muslim control, it must always be forever. And According to Muslim. Law. And I know if, the, if there's a mosque and it gets destroyed, it has to, it always has to be a mosque there. And the, the mosque uh, uh, that we're talking about here, um, you know, is you just said it's, it's in uh, uh, Muslim control. Right. Uh, but, but, um, but then you said about the exca excavation underneath and that uh, the Israelis would like to, 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 to see what's under there. Mm -hmm. And my question would be this. Aren't uh, Muslims interested in archaeology? I don't understand. Yeah, I don't. I think by and large, the fear, the the Muslim authorities. Here's the Israeli perspective on this. The Muslim authorities would believe either the Israelis are doing the excavations in order to destroy the mosque. It's actually technically not a mosque. The Dome of the Rock is technically not a mosque. Um, or the, the fear is that um, it will give even more credence to the fact that the Jews uh, had their temple there. I would say uh, my sense is, is that um, Muslim religious authorities would deny that there was ever a Jewish temple on the, uh, on the Temple Mount. So, so denial is not just a river in Egypt. Exactly. Uh, so the, but the, one of the interesting things is uh, I was once standing in this prayer area 
and almost from the spot where this picture is taken, there was a there's a gate. And um, when, I'm just standing watching people pray. I love standing and watch pe watching people pray. Occasionally, I will even join them if they're praying, uh, uh, you know, Jewish prayers. Um, and so, at one point in time, I'm 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 in this prayer area, and they open this gate. And they start walking in and I, you know, I kind of walk over to take a look and they say, no, come on, join us. And so we walked down a tunnel, which is now the Western Wall Tunnels. This was actually before the Western Wall Tunnels were open. We walked maybe a hundred yards or so and we're in a tunnel underground and there's a little prayer niche. And that's as close as you can get to the spot of where the original Temple Mount stood and pray as Jews. So three times a day, they go there and have a have a little service under there, and I was privileged to join them uh, once. So this is the Western Wall today. So this is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So here, just to give you a sense of where we are, here's Robinson's Arch, right under the word mixed. Um, Muslims enter by other gates, non-Muslims enter by this, it's called the Mugrabi uh, Gate, and they built the bridge and you can, enter, you can enter here depending on how, how bad tensions are. And then the Western Wall area. Now this was all houses, you know, for hundreds of years, the area open to the Western Wall, I don't think I have an image of this, was very narrow and small. But after 67, the Israelis basically demolished all the homes in this area and built this huge plaza. So technically the Western Wall is considered to be a synagogue by Israel and by the, by the rabbis. So as a Orthodox synagogue, there's a men's section and a women's section. This area is, op whoops, uh, that area is open, but there's a, there is a, a small mechitza, you can look over it. Mechitza is a dividing area between the men's section and the women's section. Um, and then they've recently built a, um, a prayer, so, so this is only Orthodox prayer services. They've recently built a prayer area near Robinson's Arch for conservative and reform Jews. And the last time I visited Israel, uh, my letter trip to Israel, we had, a, um, we had Friday night services uh, here on, on Robinson's Arch, near Robinson's Arch. So moving on to Christian holy spots, because I can't help myself. Uh, not far from this area is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, it's the holiest spot in the Christian world, and it is plausibly the site of Jesus' crucifixion. That was doubted when the, um, uh, when the Brits came in, in you know, 100, 150 years ago, not 150 years ago, they decided that this couldn't be the site of Jesus' crucifixion and burial because it was within a walled city and under Jewish law, you can't bury someone inside a walled city, but subsequent uh, archeology span has proved that in the time of Jesus, and we'll see an image of this, that it was outside the walled city. Um, and Jewish graves have been found inside the, the church. And I can and would speak, you know, for two or three hours just on, you know, Jerusalem. I, I adore Jerusalem and, and these holy sites. Um, it was a site, it was a Roman temple in, in Roman times, in early Roman times. And one of the things that makes it suspect as, as an ancient church is the Romans liked to build their temples on existing holy sites. And uh, Queen Helena, who is Constantine's mother, visited the Holy Land and, and found some graves in this, uh, in this area. And she declared this to be Jesus' burial site. And, um, and the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre has been built on this site. And the site and the city have been subject to crusades. I think Jerusalem has been conquered something like 35 times. Didn't she also um, uh, recover the cross? Yeah, so she, so she claims she found the true cross. And there have been you know, bits of that find supposedly transferred to various churches around the world. I saw a very interesting documentary where they did carbon dating on those and none of them date back to, to that time, at least the ones where they're allowed to do the carbon dating. So it's, it's suspect as to whether she actually found 
uh, the true cross, of course. Remember, well, it's the, it's the thought that counts. Yeah, yeah, and it's not that that long after uh, Jesus' uh, death, so it's a few hundred years, so it was plausible. Uh, so this is the way the area would have looked in Jesus' time, and in, in the year 30, the walls of the city, uh, a, a spot called Calvary, Calva, uh, meaning or Golgotha in Aramaic, uh, Calvary probably in, in a Latin-derived language, meaning apparently the, the rock looked like a skull. Uh, and uh, this is the way the church looks today. And here's kind of the, um, I guess, the, the lay of the land in Jesus' time and where graves would have been in the, in the walls of, uh, you know, basically in, in, uh, bored into caves in the rock. Uh, and, uh, and there's the, the crucifixion. It's, you know, a very short walk inside, all inside this church to go from the crucifixion site to the site of Jesus' uh, tomb. Here are some photographs. Um, this is the entry. If it looks cr kind of crazy and haphazard and nothing like, you know, St. Peter's in Rome, it's because there are about seven or eight different Christian groups that fight for every square inch of the church. Uh, and so therefore they can't, do a lot of refurbishing to the church, because if anybody makes a repair, that gives them a claim. And since they all dispute everything, they have this problem. So here is a ladder. This ladder has been here for 150 years, sitting on this spot. Why? Because at some point in time, somebody used the ladder to fix something. And apparently what they were fixing up here belonged to one church, where the ladder stood belonged to another church and they had a big fight about it. And so they, couldn't e they wouldn't even agree to take it down. So I can personally testify that that ladder has been there for at least 30 years because I always go to this site and apparently it's been there for quite a bit longer than that. This is actually the spot of the crucifixion as you might guess from that imagery. This area belongs to the, um, I think this is the Greek Orthodox church and just to the right is the spot of where Jesus was nailed to the cross. That belongs to the, to the Catholic church, the Roman church. And then this is a frame built upon what was Jesus' tomb. Um, and lots of people trying to, trying to visit. Um, if you walk in these areas here, there's one spot, I don't remember exactly which one, where you can see sort of a very unimproved area and there are a bunch of Jewish tombs in that, which again, adds plausibility to the, to the likelihood that this in fact was Jesus' uh, burial and of course, if you, and crucifixion site. Also in the same neighborhood is the Dome of the Rock, built approximately in the year 700 of the Common Era. And you know, it's like, what was the color of Washington's white horse? What's under the Dome of the Rock? A rock. Um, the rock has significance to Muslims, because it was, uh, in their interpretation, the site of Muhammad's night flight from earth to heaven on a winged horse named Al-Burak. Uh, Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran at all. Uh, this spot where Muhammad ascends into heaven to meet with Allah uh, is called in the Quran Al-Aqsa, which means the far place. Uh, but, uh, but it uh, the, according to Muslim interpretation, that spot is in fact Jerusalem. Uh, in Jewish tradition, the, that rock is the, is the peak of Mount Moriah, which was the place where Abraham went to sacrifice his son Isaac. And then in Jewish mystical tradition, I talked about this when we talked about Kabbalah, it is the spot of the creation of the universe. God creates the universe in one particular spot. Where was that spot? It was the rock. So the, the mystics give the name to that rock of Evan Hashtia, the foundation stone. Murray. Uh, you mentioned this is the third holiest spot. The first holiest spot is in Mecca. And I guess that's the Kaaba, uh, supposedly built by the Abraham Kaaba. himself. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ac yeah, actually, to be it's, it's definitely in Mecca. And it was supposedly a pagan worship place. 
and and Abraham and his son Ishmael dedicated it to Allah. And I would love to visit. I think that the second one is in Medina, which I think was was um, Muhammad's yeah. traditional home. Yes. Okay. And technically, it's not a mosque. I don't actually know what the technical distinction between a mosque is and, and the rock is, uh, but probably, well, I, I don't know. If I don't know, I don't know. So here are some images of the dome. Of course, it's, you know, it's the kind of characteristic site that you think of uh, when you think of, um, of Jerusalem. Um, one of the interesting things is as you look very closely in Islam, they take the prohibition against graven images very seriously. So all the decorations are really passages from the Quran in a very beautiful, beautifully written Arabic and inside the dome also, it's decorated with passages from the Quran. Here are people at prayer. And I have spent hours, and fortunately the year I lived in Israel uh, was a very peaceful year. So, you know, except for, for times of prayer, you could go up and visit. So I would spend hours sitting outside, spend hours even inside. So here's a kind of a cutaway of the Dome of the Rock and there is a rock, and here's this is actually a, a photograph from the surface, and parts of it have been chiseled away. And I have this this wonderful book about the archaeology of the Temple Mount, and they have actually even figured out the probable location of where the Holy of Holies was based on, you know, the the, the what's what remains of what was a floor to the to the temple. Uh, and you can you can kind of look over a, a, a you know a, 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 a wooden fence and see the rock, and I don't know why, but you can actually walk into the rock. There it, it is hollowed out, and it's a prayer area. And I've spent hours in there too. They won't let you sit down, so you have to have some stamina. Uh, and I'm a closed circuit camera, so they didn't catch me praying or putting on a yarmulke or anything like that. But one of the most amazing moments of my life was just standing there with, with my wife, Sonia, you know, with the idea that this was the spot of the creation of the universe, at least in mystical uh, uh, Kabbalistic thought. So what we see in Jerusalem today is the retaining walls of Herod's temple. That's what the Western wall is. And these stones are massive. You know, we could spend a lot of time wondering how they got these stones put into place and there's a lot written on them and you also see gates and stairs uh the western wall as you know is holy uh, it is the closest place you can get to the holy of holies the inner sanctum of the temple and there's midrash and tradition that while the rich uh israelites paid for the construction of much of the temple uh, the poor people chipped in and, and built the, the Western Wall. And of course you see uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Dome of the Rock. So any questions on, on sort of the temple and Jerusalem? Um, every now and again, some lunatic climbs that's Jewish, goes there to try and dedicate and lay a, found, a cornerstone for the third temple. And when I say all hell breaks out, I mean that literally, you know, people start killing. Uh, folks and when they do that. And uh, that's one of the things that started one of the intifadas. Uh, because in Jewish tradition, Orthodox tradition, when the Messiah comes, the third temple will be built. Uh, and um, so one idea is, well, if we go up there and we lay a cornerstone, that will, you know, encourage God to build the to bring the Messiah and build the third temple. Uh, hasn't worked yet. So any questions on, on broadly that subject, sort of ancient Israel and the temple? So um, yeah, so, so the synagogue, synagogue is a Greek word. It means house of meeting. Remember the Greeks, the Jews, uh, you know, around the time of the Maccabees, we have Hanukkah on our mind and the revolt against the Greek uh, Syrians um, Jews were speaking Greek, and uh, some of us are very interested in the translation of the Bible into Greek. Um, 
And so there's a lot of Greek words which enter Judaism, and probably the most notable is synagogue, which means house of meeting. If you, uh, the word for synagogue in Hebrew is Beit Knesset, which also means the house of meeting. Uh, the synagogue is not a temple. The word temple refers to a place where you sacrifice animals. And until recently, you would never see a synagogue named, you know, Temple Nerami, Temple Adad Elohim, Temple Beth Torah. For quite a while, the only people who were, the only movements that had their synagogues called temples was Reform Judaism. Um, but there are now conservative um, synagogues that are called temples, and those of us in Thousand Oaks know about Temple Etz Chaim. And I, you know, I don't know the details about how, you know, how those decisions get made. Um, so the key elements in a synagogue has, is there anyone at least on the call here that, that has never been in a synagogue? Okay, so that's something that should be put, Suzanne, on your to-do list once synagogues get open again. Um, so in every synagogue, you will have an ark. And traditionally, the ark ought to be, when you're facing the ark, you ought to be facing Jerusalem, which for most of us in this country would be facing east. Um, and in the ark would be Torah scrolls. Um, and there's a ner tamid, which we think of as the eternal light, but it really means a continuous light. And that, and again, the the light was always lit at the temple. That's our song. That's our story about Hanukkah. Was the you know the oil? Uh, they didn't have enough oil to to uh, the first thing they did once they cleansed the temple was to light the Ner Tamid, but they didn't have sufficient oil. So the miracle of Hanukkah is that one day's worth of oil lasted for eight days. Um, but it means continuous, not eternal. People freak out when the light bulb burns out in the Ner Tamid above the ark. It's not a crisis. We don't have to buy you know, an uninterruptible power supply and all those other things. You just change the bulb. I should tell one quick story about changing the light bulb in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. So in this area, I don't know if I told this story before, in this area where there are other Jewish graves, it's not decorated at all. It's bare, you know, walls and bare floor. And there's one kind of sodium arc lamp in the middle of the room so you could see what you're doing when you walk in there. And because this area was fairly recently discovered, it doesn't belong to any of the particular churches, which is to say they all claim it belongs to them. You with me so far? Yes, okay. So I, I heard this presented by a rabbi who was the, in Jerusalem, the minister of interfaith or interreligious affairs. And he told the story about how that light bulb has never ever burned out. And he told the following story. He said one day he's in his office and he starts getting phone calls from each of the heads of the churches in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And they say, we understand that this light bulb has burned out and we just want you to know that we are going to change the light bulb. Now that is an, a crisis because whoever got to change the light bulb would then have claim over that area. So the rabbi said, don't do anything, let me look into it. And he gets a call from, I think there's seven different Christian churches that lay claim to, to parts of the church. That night, he goes with a ladder and a replacement light bulb, and he changes the light bulb. And the next morning, he calls the other churches and say, good news, it was you know fake news, uh, the light bulb didn't burn out, didn't burn out, and that light bulb can never burn out. Another sign of the problem is the keys to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I don't know if it's ever locked, are actually held by a Muslim family. Um, because again, no one, no one Christian group could hold the, the keys. There's typically an elevated place called a bima, where the Torah scrolls are read and then there's prayer books and study places. And again, remember, this is actually a revolution in Judaism with the idea that once the temple is destroyed, you're going to replace the sacrificial service with prayer service 
and with reading sacred text, including Torah scrolls. So when they're looking for ancient synagogues, such as on top of um, Masada, you're looking for a niche in which books would be stored, in which a, you know, uh, a, um, an ark would be built, and that can tell you that this is a synagogue and not just an ordinary uh, you know, meeting hall. Um, so some issues are music. Typically, although there was music, at least singing in the, um, in the um, uh, temple in Jerusalem, there's typically not music in Orthodox synagogues because they don't want to use electricity. And they also don't want to use stringed instruments for fear that if a, if you, if a string broke, you would have to change it. And you're not supposed to do that on Shabbat. Uh, so that's controversial. And I would say you see, certainly in reform synagogues, you see organs and, and electricity. And I don't know about most conservative synagogues, but definitely not in Orthodox synagogues. In traditional synagogues, by which I, I really mean Orthodox, men and women are seated separately. And it's for reasons of modesty. And uh, so us men can keep our minds on, on the prayer, because clearly we have demonstrated we can't uh, uh, do anything else when you women are seated among us. In the United States, as you may know, typically synagogues are self-supporting. So, you know, there'll be dues and various different structures uh, to, to pay for the building, pay for the, you know, the, the, the staff, rabbi, cantor, janitors, and so on. In Israel, um, there are uh, the Orthodox synagogues are, are, are paid for by the state and the less Orthodox synagogues for the most part have to raise their own money. And so they, they raise a lot of money from Jews around the world. Uh, I don't know why I had in the US contrast. So I would say in the US, typically there's something like a due structure. This is very controversial in the world of, of Judaism is how do we raise money? In, in churches, although they, it varies widely, people often make a pledge or they just give an offering on Sundays, you know, put money in the plate. Um, and in the, uh, in the synagogue world, there is typically something approaching a due structure. And generally, synagogues are sensitive to people who can't afford to pay dues. But again, that that's varies very much synagogue by synagogue. And, you know, rabbis have horror stories about what's happened in certain synagogues. I mean, I, I, you know, I once met a family who were coming back to services on the high holidays and they, um, they told me a story that back during the depression, the local synagogue basically got very tough with you know, their grandparents, great grandparents and said, if you can't pay your dues, you just can't be a member of the synagogue. And so it took four generations three to four generations before that family walked back into a synagogue. So it's, it's one of the things that you know, I worry about a lot. Uh, lots of different looking synagogues. Here's the great synagogue in Florence. It's a magnificent building and it's, it's beautiful and it has everything except Jews uh, because there aren't very many Jews living in Florence. Here is a synagogue that I served as a student rabbi and, and uh, about a year ago in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, it was, oh, what it was? I think it was a school changed into a synagogue. This is a synagogue in Morocco that my wife's grandfather built. Basically he took half of a house. I think this is that, synagogue. yeah, half of a house. And it's, it's very small. You can see the person there and maybe there's 20 or 30 seats on each side and a few seats in the back. And it's so small that there is no women's section in this synagogue. The women would sit outside on the porch or in the courtyard while the men were praying. Um, and I conducted a bar mitzvah of Sonia's two sons here. And to my knowledge, it was the first and only time women have ever been in this synagogue to pray. Uh, and, but they insisted on sitting in the back and not mingling with the men. Uh, I'm not sure where this one is or where this one is. 
Okay, so that's the discussion of synagogues. Any question about synagogues? Okay, so I wanna move on to spirituality and the holiness of one's home. So a, one of my favorite quotes from Harold Kushner uh, is not, the, the problem or the issue is not how can I be more Jewish, but how can I be more human? Judaism, you know, for those of you who particularly are, are interested in conversion, your focus is how can I learn enough about Judaism so I can convert? Uh, for Jews, that's not the issue. The issue is how do you make sense of the world? How do you remain human in a world that throws, to be blunt, so much crap at you? And I would say religion is an answer. Judaism is the answer for Jews. With the destruction of the temple, the rabbis basically said that each of our homes become a mikdash me'at, a small temple. So some of the practices that are traditionally related to the temple get transferred to the home. And this, of course, will come out in the, in the Talmud, the details. So in the temple, there were ritual breads that were prepared. And so in the home, these become challah. In the temple, there was ritual washing before doing the sacrificing. So in traditional homes, you know, Jews will wash their hands ritually, not for cleanliness, but ritually before, um, before eating. And, and, and many, many things like this. So the question is, how do we make our homes and our lives more holy? So actually, I think, what are your thoughts? How do you make your home a holy place? See if anybody wants to chime in. What could you do to make your home holy? Uh, I always take off my outside sneakers mm -hmm. so that that doesn't touch the inside. Okay. And in some cultures, that's, you know, obligatory. And I think it, it's not only just a matter of physical cleanliness, but also a sense of not bringing the outside in. Okay, good. Any other thoughts about what, how you make your home a special holy place? I mean, within our home, when we have mezuzot, but we also, there's just different elements within the house that I think any room you go in, you're going to feel some type of connection and some realization of it being a Jewish household. So it's it's one of those where just similar to the mezuzot being something that as we go through a door, any doorway, and I mean, especially the main doorway is going out, mm -hmm. is that reminder. But it's not just that. It's little tiny pieces that are in pretty much any room that's just, you recognize when you see it, when you experience it, it just kind of gives you an opportunity to kind of step away from the world on the outside and this kind of brings you in. And just to make sure we're all on the same uh, language, mezuzot is the plural of mezuzah and the mezuzah is a tiny, is a, is a box with a tiny scroll in it. And in Jewish tradition, uh, you're supposed to put that on every door of your home, except for bathrooms and storage areas. <laughs> and I would say it's far more common to see people putting it on exterior doorways and very much along the lines of, of your comment. Um, I remember one teacher saying, or reading somewhere, if someone came into your home, how would they know it's a Jewish home? Uh, now, you know, not all of you have Jewish homes yet, <laughs> but, uh, but, but that's a question. So that's, uh, that's something to think about. Deb. <clears throat> I, I think one thing that you can do is just to honor the people in it, in your home. Yes, I would, yes. So treating them as though they're created in the image of God. So I, I know people who like the idea of, uh, of um, wearing a yarmulke inside the house. You know, like the, it's the flip, flip and literally the flip and Murray of, of your thought of taking your shoes off, take your shoes off and put on a yarmulke um, to, um, you know, to signify that your home has some kind of special status. Uh, any other thoughts? 
it, it is a mitzvah, which is to say a commandment to feed your animals before you eat. And I'm always very conscious of that, having a bunch of different animals floating around the house uh, from time to time. So here are some ideas that work for me. Taking God more seriously. Uh, seriously, but not literally. So God, Torah, Jewish law, everything we've been talking about. Um, seeing yourself as God's tool. So I love the idea that when I do something, you know, that I, I feel commanded to in Jewish law, I see myself as God's hands in doing that. And sometimes that is a very powerful experience. You know, just personally, um, um, very early in my rabbinic career, I, I think I was ordained, but I'm not even sure. Yeah, I think I was ordained. We had a tragic death in the congregation. A 16-year-old kid was killed in a car accident. And, um, and you know, with everything attendant to, to that. And, you know, I was called into the, the emergency room and, and spent time with, with his mother and father. And I remember feeling, you know, this is like the worst of the worst. What the heck do I do? I called my rabbi. Uh, asked him, what the heck do I do now? And I really felt like I was channeling God in supporting this family. And I had words of comfort coming out of me. And I had no idea where they were coming from. But just sort of feeling myself to be open to that role. One thing, the next thing where this idea, you act spiritual, people think you are spiritual and expect you to be spiritual and you become spiritual. This literally happened to me. I mean, I would talk the way I talk and people would, I remember one guy, a guy I worked with said, you're really a spiritual guy. And that surprised me because I didn't think of myself as a spiritual guy. But the funny thing was now around this guy, I had a standard I had to live up to because he thought of me as being a spiritual guy and I didn't want to you know, crush that image. So, um, so, so it's, you know, it, it's an iterative process. And I always say, don't worry about believing. Um, this is not necessarily a uh, left brain, ultra rational uh, thought process. It's more about, about just letting yourself go with that flow. Anyway, that's what works for me. Um, so exercising your right brain, um, and you know, there's, there's this theory about your left brain being more rational, your right brain being more intuitive and musical and artistic and so on. So there are things in Judaism with which you are now familiar that uh, I think are very right brain, not, you know, not so powerful intellectually, but very powerfully uh, symbolically. And you know, wearing a talit, uh, lighting Sabbath candles, um, exiting the Sabbath with Havdalah candles and rituals, daily prayer, uh, the Shema. We talked about individual prayer, talking to God, and also listening for an answer. Um, start observing the Sabbath in some way. One, one lady that sometimes drops in on, on this class, um, Robin Feldman, taught me something which I think is just a beautiful idea she has grown uh, daughters and every night as she's lighting the candle, you know, there's, there's a Jewish tradition of blessing your children. And when my kids were little, I would bless them. And they, you know, everybody felt a little awkward about this. So they would sneeze first. So I, they felt better about me, you know, blessing them. Uh, but Robin would say the traditional blessings for her daughters as she would light the Sabbath candles or just before, just after, I don't remember which. And she said, no matter where her daughters are in the world, and they, you know, various places in the country, in the world, they would know at sunset in California, they were getting blessed. And I thought that was a, a beautiful idea. Um, if you, so my point is observe the Sabbath in some way. I certainly am not strictly Sabbath observant, but there ought to be some way of making the Sabbath a different kind of day than just every day of the week. You know, if you want to talk about the traditional ways of observing it, we can talk about it, but chances are, you know, you would be studying with a different rabbi. 
So I love the idea, certainly of Sabbath services, and I love the idea of Torah study. And some of you have joined, you know, the Torah study. There's this wonderful Torah study at Temple Adad Elohim, uh, and also Temple Beth Torah on Saturday mornings. And so that's, you know, I, I think, I can't remember if I have it here. Maybe I have it someplace else. I, I, I love the thought that when I pray, I talk to God. When I study Torah, God talks to me. And by Torah study, I don't only mean studying the first five books of the Bible, but, but any kind of, of study of sacred materials. Uh, saying blessings, we talked about blessings um, a while ago of a wine and bread, and then my favorite blessing, Baruch Atah Adonai which is the blessing on seeing sights of beauty or natural wonder. Um, keeping kosher. Reform Judaism doesn't prevent you from being kosher. I would say the essence of Reform Judaism is we're open to anything. Be aware of what Jewish law has to say. Experiment with Jewish law and see if you feel like it elevates your spirituality or your connection with God. So having said that, I will go over the basic rules of keeping kosher pretty quickly. For meat, for land animals, um, the animals that are kosher are animals that have a split hoof, like a two-fingered hoof, and chew their cud. I think we talked about this. Um, maybe not. Um, animals like cows and, and sheep and goats um, eat the grass. They swallow it, and it's, I think, digested in one stomach, and then they bring it up again, and they chew it again. That's called chewing the cud or ruminating, and then they swallow it, and it goes to a different stomach to be digested. So in order to be kosher, both of those conditions have to be met. Those are the biblical traditions, uh, and then the rabbis add more about kosher slaughtering. I think, yeah, I'm going to talk about that. So, for example, a pig has split hooves but doesn't chew its cud. Um, and I'm sure there are animals that chew their cud but don't have split hooves. Certainly, other animals like reptiles, uh, rabbits, and so on that I don't know if rabbits chew their cud, uh, but they definitely don't have split hooves, as anybody who's ever had a rabbit's foot knows. And you should react with horror about all of those limping rabbits. Uh, that, <laughs> died so we could have rabbit's feet. Um, with fowl, with birds, there's a list in the Bible. And, um, and if they're on the list as being kosher, they're kosher. If they're not on the list, they're not kosher. So, you know, chickens and ducks and geese and, and so on are not on the list. And by the way, in the, of the land animals, meat and fowl, no animal that eats other animals is kosher. So lions and tigers and bears, oh my, not kosher. Uh, they don't, clearly they wouldn't chew their cud if they're, uh, you know, um, meat eaters or, or omnivores. Uh, and the same thing for, uh, for the birds. So birds of prey don't, uh, don't fit uh, on the kosher list. Yes, Murray. I just posted a link on the chat um, of that uh, sing-songy, Kosher, oh, kosher animals thing that I sent you oh. several weeks ago. Uh huh. Okay, it's, cool. It's it's a kind of an earworm, a little so. Okay, thank you. So you can check that out. Um, for fish, for a fish to be kosher, it has to have fins and scales. Um, and uh, and then in terms of meat and m milk and meat mixing. Well, the Bible says you don't cook a baby goat in its own mother's milk. And for none of these rules are explained. So there are some scholars, uh, you know, the ancient rabbis who believe there were health issues, and that's why we have them. And others would say that would reduce the Torah to a health textbook. And it would also raise the question of, you know, now that we know with pork, for example, if we cook it thoroughly, it's not a health issue. Does that mean you can eat pork? And the answer is no. You still can't eat pork. 
Uh, but of course, people try and tease out the reasons of why be kosher. Um, I, I came across one scholar who's thought that the idea, so in the Bible, it just says, don't cook a baby goat in its own mother's milk. And there's some theory that this may have been a Canaanite uh, magical worship practice, uh, which the Bible would prohibit because a lot of the Bible is about prohibiting, you know, idol worship practices. By the way, I came across, I think, in, in one of the books I recently read, that that in that section where it says, don't cook a baby goat in its, in its mother's milk, the Aramaic translation, the Targum, just says, don't eat meat with milk. So that's an interesting uh, thing going on there. And it may have been that the rabbis, by prohibiting you know, chicken parmesan, you can't cook a chicken in its own mother's milk, uh, were basically saying, if you're eating meat, you had to kill something, and milk is the essence of life. So you you don't mix. And a lot of Judaism is about not mixing categories. Um, Pregnant Solution write in their book, um, Nine Questions People Ask About Judaism's Reasons for Kashrut, and I like them. One is elevating the animal activities of life. So an animal eats whatever an animal can eat. Um, the idea here is a lot in religion takes what are animalistic impulses and tries to discipline them. So the idea of basically, and even arbitrarily saying, these foods we're gonna eat, these foods we're not gonna eat, says, and as someone who you know was pretty kosher for a while, I, I, I no longer keep strictly kosher. Anytime you sit down to eat, you gotta start asking questions about the origin of this, of this food. Uh, to pause and reflect on the taking of life. By and large, all the only foods that raise kosher issues are animal uh, foods. All vegetables are kosher. Uh, to remind you that you're Jewish and to keep cultures together. If you can only eat kosher food, if you're a stranger visiting a town uh, and you know the town doesn't have a kosher restaurant, which was, certainly was true in antiquity, you would have to find some place to eat. And so that would be someone's home and, you know, keeps Jews meeting Jews. It prohibited a lot of, uh, if you can't eat with a person, it's hard to do business with them. Uh, and chances are your son is not going to marry their daughter. So all of those things I think are behind Kashrut. And then making every day holy. Uh, you can be religious in the way you approach business problems, the way you eat lunch, where you write your checks, not only in terms of you know, Bible and synagogue. So I think I showed this before um, in terms of holiness in the supermarket. So uh, just to go through it quickly, here's a supermarket, you know, in your everyday life. Well, now everybody's wearing masks and so on, but you walk into a supermarket, you're in a hurry, it's expensive. You gotta get stuff, you gotta get home. It can very easily not be a religious experience. But in one sermon I gave, you know, I said, look at this place. In a world where I think something like 40% of people don't have clean water to drink, much less healthy food to drink, here laid out before you like a cornucopia is almost any food you can imagine, neatly organized, all color coordinated, all the, the boxes are facing forward. They've all been USDA inspected. It's an astounding gift that you've received. Just more, you know, of, of what you know this looks like. And, you know, I love to talk about the vegetables and, and how clean they are and how beautiful they are and how they get spritched. And if you go to really fancy uh, supermarkets, they may even play a little thunder. This, I think, is hysterical. Uh, They'll play a little thunder, so presumably the carrots think they're still growing in the ground and it's actually raining. Um, and then I think I told you, you know, that my, my story of what became called the, the mustard sermon. And I said, if I had, didn't have any mustard at all, I would be perfectly okay with that. Give me deli mustard and I am ecstatic. Uh, so for one sermon, I, I went to... Um, uh, I can't remember the name of the uh, nice supermarket. And I counted how many choices of mustard I had. 
um, at Gelson's. And there were 39 different choices of, you know, coarse ground, fine ground, gray poupon, um, deli mustard, French's mustard, you name it, all these mustards. And then I had to give the sermon again a few years later, so I couldn't use mustard again, so I used olive oil. So I went to Whole Foods and counted the number of choices I had for just olive oil, and there were 92. And as I, you know, I love to joke, extra virgin, not so virgin, a little slutty, uh, seasoned with various, uh, you know, seasonings. But this is not sunflower oil or, God forbid, Crisco. This is all different choices of olive oil. So again, looking at this through eyes that are trying to discipline themselves to holiness, I find I live in a world where not only do I have mustard, but I have a choice of 39 kinds of mustard. Not only do I have olive oil, but I have a choice of 92 different options in olive oil. And so if I treat this as a gift from God, the thing I love about religious spirituality is that gift comes with strings attached, the strings of the tzitzit. These strings are obligations. The question is, what do I do to give back to God? And of course, in the Jewish understanding, what do you do? You take care of God's children. So going to the supermarket can be a religious experience. Other ways of enhancing Jewish spirituality, again, taking Judaism seriously, tzedakah, which is translated as charity, but it comes from the word tzedek, which means um, uh, justice. Um, you're always obligated to give something. A Jew that doesn't give tzedakah is not just selfish. He or she has committed an act of injustice. And the theory is that God has entrusted to us a certain amount of money. How much? 10%. The concept of tithing is a Hebrew Bible concept. Uh, and that money doesn't really belong to us. God has made us God's agent to make sure that money winds up where it should. Uh, I don't think we've talked a lot about Lashon Hara or Gossip, but that's one of the 613 commandments. And there's a, there is a lot to be said on the subject of gossip and, and you know being very careful about your speech. One of the rabbinic thoughts is, there's a couple of sort of nice pieces of imagery about this, that we have two ears and one mouth, which reminds us that we should listen twice as much as we speak. This is clearly something I am not a, uh, an observer of. Uh, and then they also say, words are like arrows, not like a sword, because a word once said can never be recovered, just like when you shoot an arrow if you change your mind a second later, the arrow is still on its way. If you draw a sword, you can put the sword back and not use it. So words are very, very powerful in Judaism and understood to be very powerful. Eliminating idolatry, but the question is, what are modern idols? Uh, the idea of idolatry is we worshiping the work of our hands, things we make ourselves. So jobs, cars, bodies, careers, you know, cell phones, and so on. In our world, the question is not who owns our bodies, which we think of as, you know, slaves or, or, or worshiping some concrete god, but, but who controls our souls and our time. Uh, isn't the prototypical busy executive really a slave? Um, you know, the old rabbinic line is that nobody on their deathbed ever regretted not spending enough time at the office. And I think I may have commented, I, I gave a sermon, it's probably on my website, called What I'm Learning About Life at Funerals. And I jot down notes of what people say in the very few minutes they have at a funeral of one of their loved ones about, you know, what's the sweet memories that, that occurred to them on this most powerfully significant day of memory, namely the day of the funeral of their spouse, you know, parent, grandparent. And it's, it's never about what a great car dad always drove or what terrific uh, places we went to on vacation. It's usually about just the sweetest things. You can listen to the sermon. Um, 
yeah, there's the line when I study and read. When I pray, I speak to God. When I study Torah, God speaks to me. I often think about the idea of being Jewish for yourself, not for your kids. You know, you're only going to be with your kids for a short period of time. You're going to be with yourself forever. And if your kids see you taking your religion seriously, they will take religion seriously. If they see you, you know, forcing them go to religious school, but you're completely ignoring it, they will learn hypocrisy. Uh, and the emphasis of this is to start. Halakha, Jewish law, means a path. It's not where you're going. It's not where you are, but where you are going. Ah, and that's the end of that. Oh, it automatically stopped screen sharing. Thank you. Okay, so any questions or comments? Yeah, question, Rabbi. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the quote from Harold Kushner about being more human, is that from a specific book of his? Or Boy, I, 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 if it, it may well be, but I don't know what it is. But, but don't worry, he's only written about a dozen books. Okay, <laughs> I'll let you know when I find it. Yeah, and they're all worth reading. Um, okay. Yeah, his books are amazing. Um, yep. Um, any other questions or comments? So you know we're about to begin the holiday of Hanukkah. And I'm sure I mentioned this when we discuss Hanukkah, that um, while it is a minor holiday and Hanukkah is not the Jewish... Complete the sentence? Christmas. Thank you. Um, there are some serious spiritual lessons about Hanukkah, and I just posted a comment on this on my Facebook page. And basically, uh, it's very powerful this week because what they celebrate, there's a couple of things that are being celebrated about Hanukkah. The word Hanukkah means dedication. And what they're celebrating is the rededication of the temple in Jerusalem. And it was horribly foul. They sacrificed pigs and, and there was garbage in the temple. And, uh, and as I, I think I, I may have mentioned in one of these classes, there's some theory that the Western Wall tunnels were actually built to bring enough water to the Temple Mount area so they could cleanse the temple. I don't know if that's, if, if that's uh, still considered to be true. And then they had a dedication and that's what they celebrated. So we had two temples that were built and were brand new when they were dedicated. But we don't have a holiday for either of those. We have a holiday for the moment when something was horribly fouled could once again be brought back to its state of holiness. So I always think of Hanukkah as the holiday for those of us, and I would say all of us, who are struggling with our lives to make them pure and holy and worthy of being created in the image of God. I think of Hanukkah as the holiday for people who are in recovery from different uh, addictions. I think of Hanukkah as a holiday for someone who's going through some difficult medical treatment, specifically chemotherapy, uh, because you've had cancer ravaging your body and now you're taking chemotherapy, which is ravaging your body and Hanukkah is looking forward to the time when you don't have to be, uh, you know, subject to that and your body is once again pure. So I found it awesome and deeply meaningful that the first doses in this country of the, of the vaccine, the vaccine is up for approval, I think, tomorrow. And, uh, you know, and very shortly thereafter, there will be vaccine available for us. So this is coincidental with Hanukkah. And of course, the mystics would say there are never coincidences about anything. So I find that uh, very powerful. And skipping, uh, yes, the mosses. <laughs> hey. um, it's somewhat of a tangent, but when you talk about the temple being fouled, it reminds me of uh, the Doheny Synagogue in Budapest mm -hmm. that was during the war was taken over by the Nazis and their, their entire temple 
was used for their horses mm. and horribly fouled. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and it is a gorgeous. I've been in it, but I, I didn't remember. We didn't go on a tour, so we just visited. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't really know the history. Yeah. And it, what I find to be fascinating and just beautifully hopeful is that it is a live, vibrant synagogue mm -hmm. where they do tours for people of all different faiths, mm -hmm. but they are also still very much holding their services. And I just find it very beautiful and very hopeful. Yep. Yep. I agree. Uh, any other comments? I, ha I have some Hanukkah presents for you. Murray. Oh, uh, should I let you just go first? No, no, no. I want to. I want to wrap up. Um, yeah, it's about Hanukkah. Um, you know, I, I I grew up celebrating it and everything, and then I stopped. And when I got back into uh, you know learning about Reform Judaism, uh, I had you know had spoken with the rabbi here, and you know we decided. I, I decided you know I'll put out the menorah and I'll even light them in the order that is. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, meant for the outside world and mm -hmm. the inside world. Yeah, I remember you raising that. And um, I always thought about it, though, as like this tentative thing. It's like, let's put this one light on and see, you know, if something happens bad. All right, let's put on two. Then, mm -hmm. um, But uh, it, it I'm going to do something different this year. And as uh, someone who's identifying with reform, I guess I have that liberty um, that... Uh, it, although the, the problem reminds me what you said about um, assimilation. Now, anti-Semitism is certainly not good for Jewish people, uh, but you also said that assimilation might also not be good for Jewish people because uh, perhaps of some dilution of, of, of theology. Um, however, I see assimilation as something good because uh, it's better not to be thought of as the other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I certainly had that feeling when I was in grade school, like, you know, uh, Jews are not the large percent of, of, of anywhere in this country, uh, even in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, I, what I've decided I'm going to do this year is I'm just putting all eight lights on and the, and the shamus. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got them even on now. And I'm just going to do it like Christmas lights. So I'm just going to be out and, and, and loud and proud or whatever they're saying that is to just, all right, here's all eight. And I'm, I'm leaving them up till after New Year's, just like everybody else. Okay. So let me and that show way, you. And that way, you know, it, it's kind of a, a, a props to Judaism. You know, it's like uh, something that might, assimilate or normalize it so that it's not something to, you know it's something that that's more holiday like and anyway christmas mm -hmm. here anyway is not christian it's about buying toys okay so, so i don't know if you can you guys see the image that i have of the menorah in yeah in nazi germany time so yeah i remember names. that one and it was also a you know an episode in um in montana I think it was in Whitefish, Montana, but I'm, but I'm not sure which. No, it wasn't in Whitefish. There was another town where someone had a Hanukkah in their window and somebody threw a brick through the window. And the newspaper published a color image of Hanukkiot. And everyone in the town put the image of the menorah, the Hanukkiah, in their windows. And I think actually the result of that was the person who actually threw the rock ultimately you know, came and, and developed a relationship with the person who owned the house. So I would say um, I, I rarely speak against assimilation uh, for the main reason that I think there are enough rabbis speaking against assimilation. They don't need me. And I would agree that assimilation has some positive effects, one of which is, you know, I think uh, most people here, either th in your immediate families or in your extended families, have non-Jews that are now members of your family, and they, uh, even if you and your spouse are Jewish, and now they have learned something about Jews and Judaism, and they can never think of Jews in the same old way as before. 
So I think there's, there's positive elements to understanding. I personally resist the idea of making Hanukkah the Jewish Christmas. I'm about to, to, uh, to sing a Hanukkah carol for you. To, it's sort of a counterexample of that. But uh, I, lo- I want- I, I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to make it as much as Christmas as just as Christmas is the winter no, holiday, I, like I from understand. the Jewish no, time or something. Yeah, I, just... I understand. Uh, I, would, I would actually, the message I would want to give is when I put a menorah in the window, I do it traditionally one at a time. And I'm hoping people will ask me about it. People that see it, you know, why isn't it all lit up? Um, I once had a couple, and I'll, I'll call on you in a second, uh, both Deb and, and the Mosses. Uh, I once had a couple in Bozeman, Montana, say they like to put lights up in the house and they put blue and white because it's Jewish. And they're not doing it because of Christmas, they're doing it just because they like the way it looks. And so my answer is do it in February. Um, so I want religions to be distinct. Uh, it's my own prejudice is I want Jews to act like Jews. I want Christians to act like Christians. I want well, to act like, yeah, I, I don't think there's much of a, of a problem of, I mean, assimilate. I mean, they used to think of America as the, as the, um, melting pot. Remember, it, a melting pot, but they said after when I got older, they said, no, it's the salad bowl. Yes. So, so I mean, so, just so, to have the menorah in there for me is like having the radishes, you know, it's just yes, part of the salad yes. bowl. So, so I would, I would prefer that Christians treat Christmas as a serious Christian holiday. I, 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 I'm not crazy about the fact that they're, that all too often it's more about commercialism. Um, so anyway, uh, Deb, you haven't said anything much. As, as I get older, I, I get more proud and I get less shy about being Jewish in public. Mm-hmm. Um, a good example is my teacher sorority. I'm one of the only Jews and they asked me a couple of years ago, um, sing a Jewish song at our holiday party. Teach, teach us a Jewish mm-hmm. song. I mean, mm-hmm. a Hanukkah song, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I thought, what are they gonna do with that? So I thought instead of doing that, I will talk about what it was like being Jewish when I was growing up, which was very different. I was in a tiny little town, Hmm. hardly any other Jews. And my mother made me sing the Hanukkah song in Yiddish to my class. That made me have Hanukkah, don't ask. So I was shy, it was horrible. I did it every year. So I decided, you know what? I'm gonna bring my Hanukkah articles to my teacher party. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell them a little quick story about what it was like. And instead, I sang the Hanukkah song in Yiddish and in English. You know, Hanukkah, Hanukkah. Yeah, yeah. They sang with me because I said on the second part, if you know the the song in English, sing it with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Almost all of the teachers knew it and sang it with me. It was exhilarating to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad I'm not so shy anymore. It's Mm kind of freeing to be Jewish and not ashamed of it anymore. So I was mm-hmm. kind of thought I'd share that. Okay. I'd like to hear it sometime, the Yiddish. What's that? Can you sing a little bit of the Yiddish? Oi Hanukkah. I, I don't know it in Yiddish. You can sing it with me. I don't Hanukkah, know. Hanukkah, oh Hanukkah, a yan difashena, a listika, a freilika, nishtu, nachazena, ala nachendre, lach spielini. Zutte case a lot gis as in ear gish finder, sin kinder, did in a gillet halafun. Zutala neeson, like got for the neeson and kim yicher tonson. Zutala neeson, like got for the neeson and kim yicher tonson. Here you have it. <laughs> Yay, Yashakoch. Mosses, you have a hand up. Bravo. Well, I gonna, you know, I was just gonna kind of go. I'm one. I'm not gonna sing, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's interesting. I, I've, I'm a very proud and out there Jew, and I'm the only Jew in my district, my entire school district. And being superintendent, that makes it really unique. But what I think is interesting is over the years, what I have seen is more of our holiday performances in our campuses, integrating in different Jewish elements and doing it in a very respectful way, which I think has been outstanding. 
Um, and I think it's also one of those where we kind of do Hanukkah our way. We do light one candle versus <laughs> all, but I think all is all good. And, um, but we also have a, a meditation or intention or aspiration for that particular day mm -hmm. and bring that forward with the light as part of the blessing and also something that, you know, when we talk with friends or social media and, and I have done that because I want people to ask me, I want people to talk with me about mm -hmm. it. And it's been, a, it's been a really good experience in doing that because I'm able to share not just the culture and not just overall what what is Hanukkah, but overall kind of what the Jewish worldview is and how we how we kind of go through things. And um, and, and then I also we like uh, at Temple Bethel in Riverside, we have, uh, you know, we aren't able to do it this year, but we um, bring all of the Hanukkah into the into the into the temple and we light everything up and it's it's incredible and you have everything from the most traditional lurking uh, Hanukkah all the way to like dinosaurs that light up and it looks mm -hmm. like their booties are going to explode. I mean, it's really kind of fun. No, to actually, the, the dinosaur <laughs> last year caught on fire. Well, the dinosaur last year did catch on fire, which was mm -hmm. a whole nother thing. <laughs> but it's it's just something very special from a communal aspect to all be together at shul, have everything going. And 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 I think that one of the beauty, beautiful elements and having been part of a conservative community for a long time, I think it was much more traditional. And I think there was less reflective components that kind of came in. And I think that that's one of the cool aspects that we have within reform is that we are able to take holidays and traditions and keep them very conservative should we choose or mm -hmm. to put a different spin on them every year if we choose mm -hmm. and really bring it into a meaningful piece. But, um, but to be able to have a conversation point and, um, and with some of my most conservative LDS and uh, Catholic friends who ask me things, um, my office that asks me things. I decorate my office with a whole bunch of Scandinavian tomt and little gnomes all over the place. And then I've got Hanukkah stuff all over. And then people come and they ask me and, it, and it's just great having a conversation um, based upon whatever their questions are. And I think that's a little piece that we can go ahead and do. Cause again, we're never gonna be mighty as far as in numbers. But um, but we do have an opportunity to be able to shed that light out into the world, and we do that all the time. But I think Hanukkah is a really great time to do it. And that's the you know the point of being Jewish is to be a light to the nations. It's not to get everyone to be Jewish. Okay, I have two Hanukkah presents for you. They are both songs. Some of you who know me know I love to write parodies, but the first one was actually written by my son, and which I I talk about a lot because it speaks of fire safety in some summer a chaplain for the fire department, I feel almost a necessity to give you the following reminder written by my son. I had a little latke. I fried it to a crisp. My sister wouldn't eat it, but I like potato chips. Oh, latkes, latkes, latkes. You fry them in a pan. You only get them once a year, so eat them while you can. I like to light the candles. I tried to every night. My sister said it wasn't fair, so we got in a fight. Oh, candles, 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 six more than Shabbat. Be careful when you're lighting. Those flames are pretty hot. The candles caught the dreidel. The dreidel caught the drapes. My daddy picked my sister up. We all made our escape. Oh, fire, fire, fire. The flames were burning fast. I know that all the latkes and my presents would be ash. I used to have a little house. It burned for eight whole days. Miracle eight whole days. The rabbis and the firemen said they were amazed. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean no harm. Next year, all I want is a new house from State Farm. Okay, and finally, although I made a big point about Hanukkah not being the Jewish Christmas, one year long before I became a rabbi, I wrote a show for Temple of Dad Elohim with the underlying thesis that all Christmas carols were originally Hanukkah songs. So I came back in the personage of Moshe Latka, the 2,222-year-old man. Some of you will get the Mel Brooks uh, you know, connection. And I was there when Judah Maccabee, a lovely young boy, led the revolt, a revolting revolt. 
And all those songs, what the Christians sing, they was originally Hanukkah songs. So here is a closing modest example. On the first Hanukkah, the temple was dark. We had scrubbed it and cleaned it and polished the ark. And when everything was set, then we looked for holy oil. We as priests, cantors, rabbis, and even the moil. No oil, no oil, no oil, no oil. We were cranky, unhappy, each boy and each goyle. No oil, no oil, no oil, no oil. Just one little jar in all Yisrael. So we poured it in the lamp, set a bracha and lit it. And oh miracle of miracles, that one small jar did it. Lasted all of eight long days till we got more from the store to light our ne'er tummy forevermore. No oil, no oil, we didn't need no more oil to light our near tummy forevermore. So on that questionable note, I will thank you. And uh, I do have a lot of songs. I have latkes time, latkes time, latkes every day. And Hanukkah, you eat the foods which you should stay away. And fill the menorah with lots of candles. Oy, 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 and so on. <laughs> Each one a bigger groan than the one before it. So I wish you all a wonderful and happy Hanukkah. And may the vaccine, you know, the miracle, the eightfold expansion be realized Bimhe Ravi Amenu speedily and in our day. Uh, next week, we are talking, uh, speaking of the moil, life cycle, Brit Milah, B'nai Mitzvah, marriage, intermarriage, divorce, and funerals. So see you then. And for those of you who are with a conversion group, we'll be meeting tomorrow night, um, 7 o'clock, and I've sent out an email suggesting you bring a question. And your punishment. Light a candle. Yeah. If it, and your punishment, if you don't bring a question, is I'll sing more songs. So anyway, <laughs> take care and.